Hello, I'm Mark Rees and welcome to my curious ghosts and folklore podcast where in each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. Except for this episode that is, because I'll be joined by a special guest who is going to do the hard work for me. And we'll be looking at the art of storytelling, and we'll be focusing on one particularly famous, maybe that should be infamous, eerie Welsh folktale involving skeletons and a tragic love story and a giant spooky tree. And, well, I won't, I won't spoil the ending for you, but the tale of Rhys a Minor, as you've never heard it before, will be coming up later on this podcast. Now, very shortly, via the magic of the internet, I am going to be dialing in to my good friend, Mr. Owen Staten, who is, as you might have guessed by now, a storyteller, one of the finest storytellers in Wales, in in the world. And not only will he be telling us that wonderfully creepy story in his own personal way, but we'll also be chatting about exactly what it means to be a storyteller nowadays, because this is an ancient art. We can trace it back through the centuries. People sitting around campfires at night telling each other stories, and we can bring it right up to the modern day where people like Owen are keeping that tradition alive. And while you might be thinking, well, telling stories, that's what, that's what all of us do. I tell stories, you tell stories. That is not the same as what the professionals do. Again, as Owen will explain to you. And I, I mean, I tell stories on this podcast, but I do not tell stories in the way Owen does. I'm just some bloke, <laughs> some bloke with a microphone, a journalist and an author talking about my research. But I am not magically whisking you away to different times and places as the professionals do. And I know there are some people out there who do think that if you are recording a podcast like this, a podcast about spooky, creepy, weird things, then you should be hamming things up in a way, a bit like like a horror host would, and you should be all mysterious and whispery and, welcome to my podcast. And I, I don't bother with all that because, well, well because it, it sounds a bit naff um, <laughs> for, for, for want of a better swear word. And I don't swear in this podcast, so I won't. But I, I, I personally think it sounds a bit rubbish. And, you know, I could, I could do that if I wanted to. I could start every episode with funny whispering and cheesy, spooky music in the background. And just to prove that I could, here's an experiment. Hello, and welcome to my curious podcast, where, in this episode, I will be talking like a heavy breather, and it's starting to hurt, so I have to stop. Yeah, see, I won't, I won't inflict that on anyone. I think, going forward, I'll just stick to being my charismatic self. And I think that's probably a good time for me to shut up and to get Owen on the line and to talk storytelling. So this is my first ever attempt at having a special guest on this podcast. So please bear with me a little bit on this one. If there are any sound issues or technical gremlins or anything that crop up, I apologize in advance. I will live and learn from doing this, I guess. And I'm sure by the time we get our second special guest on here, things will be sounding even better. But for now, um, it's lucky Owen is my good friend because he's also my guinea pig in a way by being my very first special guest. So let's let's do this. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Owen Staten. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. It's good to be here. Owen, it's amazing to finally have you on the show. You should have been here for the first episode, really. We've done so many things together. But uh, how, how are things with you right now? 
Things are absolutely great, Mark. Um, I know um, it's been difficult times for everybody, hasn't it? But um, it's given me a time at least to sit back and sort of uh, and think about what we're doing and, and sort of think of many ideas. Um, there's been a lot of time that I've been stuck at home like everybody else. And at least I've had a time to do some writing and think of some new stories. So it's making the best of a bad time, I believe. And uh, yeah, things are okay. Excellent. And these stories, are these stories you're going to share with the world soon? Or are you just sitting there for your own amusement? Uh, a bit of both, probably. I mean, uh, I do um, write a lot of stories, but um, whether they get shared is, is another thing, isn't it? It all depends on how good it is and what sort of audience reaction it gets, really. And sometimes I'll think of an idea that you know, doesn't get to become a story to be, tell, to be told, if you like, but we'll just stay in a book, sort of a ghostly tale, if you like, locked away to be discovered one day, perhaps, and for someone to look at it and go, well, that's all rubbish, but there we are. <laughs> but somebody so, at some point is going to be blowing dust off this ancient tome. And <laughs> as they open the front page, it'll have Owen Staten was here That's right. written on it. I don't know what it'll Yeah, people will try and find out who I was then. You know, it'll be like uh, one of these untold mysteries. That go back <laughs> yes. Now, I, I mentioned uh, that you're a storyteller, uh, which yeah. is a slightly vague term, really. Can, can you explain mm -hmm. your own words, what, what it is exactly you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I thought, well, it's probably about 20 years now, Mark. I've, I've uh, worked as a performance storyteller alongside my, my, my day job. But I have uh, started off many years ago when I worked in the uh, Swansea Museum. Uh, and I used to uh, talk about Roman life and Celtic life. And uh, people would come to the museum and visit. And I would uh, talk a little bit about uh, what they used to eat, what they used to wear, where they lived, etc. But these were big sessions that went on for ages. So I had to pepper them with a bit of storytelling, telling uh, Roman and Celtic myths. And, uh, and it went really well. And from there, really, I started doing uh, more performance stories. Um, I always came up with an idea of maybe a book and uh, creating mythologies for certain areas. And I worked in the Swansea Valley for many years in my day job. And um, while I was up there, it was an amazing place full of stories and full of uh, ghostly tales and things like that. And uh, I developed a love for storytelling, always being a bit of a, a frustrated actor, really. But, uh, and uh, because I could only perform on my own a lot of the time because I wasn't in a group, um, I just started telling tales and it seemed to work. And yeah, I recorded a CD and uh, it went from there. And uh, I've been all over the world. I've been to the Edinburgh Fringe a couple of times and written my own shows. And um, it's all about basically telling a tale, but doing it in a way that is entertaining. It's playing the characters myself, using lots of different voices, using my body to, um, uh, to uh, interpret those characters, if you like. It's hard to do on an audio format, of course. But yeah. Um, yeah, just doing that and telling tales and making sure these old tales are being heard by a new audience as well. So it sounds to me, because you, you mentioned Swansea a few times there, Swansea Museum mm. and, and the valleys themselves. So in a way, did these places inspire that love of storytelling in you or was it there beforehand? And I think it was always there, Mark. And um, as a young child, I can remember being captivated by uh, the films like, and these are going back sort of years, but the old Ray Harryhausen films and the Semphoyage of Sinbad, Clash of the Titans, The Land That Time Forgot, all those type of films. I got really into sort of fantasy and stories and monsters and creatures when I was younger. And um, that always held an interest for me. And I can remember one day um, in the Swansea Valley, I think the Swansea Valley is one of the hidden gems in, in Wales, at least, and probably the UK. Uh, there's a mountain there called the Cribarth, and the Cribarth Mountain, from a distance, they call it the Sleeping Giant, and it looks like a man laying on his back. And once you look at that and you, you see it, you can never unsee it. And I've been all over the world, you know, on, on holidays and performing, and, you know, I've seen programs and read books from all over the world, and if that was anywhere else in the world, people would be going absolutely nuts for it. Mm. But here, we don't promote that enough, I don't think. I mean, I'd urge any of the listeners to just Google the sleeping giant, the crib bath, and look at it. It's a phenomenal um, uh, mountain. It's a phenomenal landmark, and yet, not many people know about things like that. So I've always tried to promote things in the area or, or in Wales in general, um, just through my storytelling. I, I found that on, on Twitter where, you know, you might just pop, pop to town or something and take a photo of a statue and just put it out there. And people go absolutely mad yeah. over this thing, which is very common to us. We walk past it all the time, but people elsewhere in the world are quite fascinated by what we take for granted in a way, and, and vice versa, I guess, isn't it? It's oh, absolutely. I mean, here in, in Wales, I think um, it's part of our culture, isn't it? We don't like to boast. We don't like mm. to shout on the rooftop. And there are so many things that we walk past on a daily basis. Like I said, the people 
uh, across the world would be going absolutely nuts for, but we just seem to take for granted. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think it's it's great that we do promote these things, and especially in times like like they are now, where we need all the interest and support in our communities and people to get involved in things again. And uh, for me, the Sleeper Giant was a big. Uh, uh, quite ironically, it was a big wake-up call. But um, yes. I, uh, when I saw that, I, I couldn't unsee it. And I just, I can remember looking at it and thinking, that's that's just amazing. Yeah. Why aren't we talking about this? But there we go. Well, we are now. So I'm we sure the, the yeah. millions of people who, who tuned into this are going to be <laughs> spreading the word everywhere now. And it's, it's yeah. a shame you're not still at the museum because um, a few weeks ago, I did an episode on the Swansea Devil which, as I'm sure you know now, has a new home and is in the museum. And you, yes. you could have been working side by side <laughs> with, with the Swansea Devil himself. Oh, yeah. It, it's quite... Um, I mean, we're going back in the late 90s when I was there. Um, and literally, I, I, I didn't work there. I was sort of employed to come in. And uh, I worked for a, a, basically a storytelling or educational theatre and education company, uh, company at the time. But I remember um, oh, it, it was a weird place because uh, I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm like, uh, I've got this weird sort of phobia that I'm, I'm terrified of taxidermy. And um, that yes, museum yeah. was full of it. So it was always really challenging to work there. Yeah. But also, one of my great, um, heroes growing up was Edgar Evans, who uh, was with Scott at the uh, South Pole, the Scott of the Antarctic. Uh, just sitting behind me now is a photograph of Edgar Evans. And um, in that museum, they've got a pair of Edgar Evans' boots. And um, how fascinated I used to be. I, I can remember I'd be like dressed as a Roman soldier. And whenever I didn't have an audience, I'd go over and look at Edgar Evans' boots, you know, and just be like, oh, he wore those, like, he wore those boots. And I'd be fascinated by it. It's, it was incredible, really. A lovely place to work. And what a great atmosphere. And I, remember, I know that in the visitor book there, there's a great quote from Dylan Thomas. Mm. And uh, it's often open on that page in, in the museum. But it says, uh, this museum belongs in a museum which I yeah. think is great, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it does, I, I, but in a really good way. And uh, I think, again, a brilliantly atmospheric place that uh, more people should visit when it's open, of course. Yes, and another nice uh, reference to another episode I did quite recently, a Dylan Thomas episode. So we're, we're going to tick off this whole list of uh, previous <laughs> episodes at this rate, but yeah. it, you, you never sneaked on the, uh, the boots while you're in the museum, though. No, they were always in a case, otherwise ah. I would have, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big feet. Big feet, yeah. yeah. So, and weirdly, again, we are talking about Swansea Museum. And the last event I, I did before the, the world fell apart, back when we could do events, was, was in Swansea Muse Museum myself. And mm -hmm. we've done loads of events together over the years, doing our sort of, you doing your storytelling and me doing my boring book person stuff. Um, and and <laughs> what are your memories of those events? Do you do you enjoy sort of getting together with similar people and talking ghost stories? Ah, oh, yeah, great. They, they've always been uh, lovely events, Mark. They were. Um, it's great, you know. Over the years that we've done them, I know there's only, there's only been a few, really, but over over the years, uh, it's nice to see the audience build and the same sort of people come back, yeah. um, expecting things to happen, you know, and and people to enjoy them just because they were they were so ad hoc when you first put them together. It was just. Myself, uh, there were a couple of dancers, wasn't there? A couple of people from the paranormal Wales would speak, and um, but what a great hour, two hours they've always been, and yeah. and um, just to show how many like-minded people who are out there with an interest in, in ghosts and folklore and storytelling really has always been really nice, and I've enjoyed every one that we've done. It's been great. The, the only downside is, I mean, you mentioned there about you know you get the, the same people coming back, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But you can't use the same stories twice then. So you have to come up with new things for each, no, each one. But no, uh, it gets me every the time. <laughs> the perils of being a storyteller really is that you sort of build up an audience who mm. tend to come you know, back to see you quite often. And you're always having to come up with new material. So yeah, it, it, it sort of does help push you though, doesn't it? To uh, create new stuff, tell new stories. And in your case, write more books. Yes, yes. And I know you've got some stories up your sleeve, which mm -hmm. nobody, I don't think is going to be aware of, and they are your personal ghost stories, which I, I think I'm right in saying these are not on the internet anywhere, are they? This is, is this an exclusive? Yeah, I, I, would not, I, I wouldn't even call them ghost stories, because no. I, I, what I get frustrated about ghost stories, as you probably know as well, that most ghost, sto ghost stories tend to be, um, yeah, I was walking down the corridor and I, I saw this figure, and, and that's it, you know, it's more yeah. of a happening, isn't it? More of a, uh, a yeah. sighting, whereas... <laughs> When I do the storytelling, they tend to be, um, you know, I, I look for tales. I look for reasons and characters and this type of thing. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, there have been a couple of, um, couple of happenings in my life, which um, 
uh, are unexplained, shall we put it. And um, there was one sort of fairly recently, which, uh, which I'll tell you about. And, um, and that was, I was in the, funny enough, going back to the museum again, but I was in the Dylan Thomas Theatre, which is um, just around the corner from Swansea Museum, where over the last couple of years, I've been lucky enough to, um, uh, to direct a couple of plays. And um, one of the plays I was quite uh, ironically sort of... Uh, directing was that was the ghost train um with by arnold ridley which is a um, a comedy sort of ghost spoof isn't it and uh, from the 1930s which is a very very good play very funny play and i was having a, a whale of a time sort of directing this play and um whilst being there uh, my son my young son had come to um uh, to watch this session and um i was directing the actors were on stage and i was sort of stood in the uh, auditorium and in my hand, I had, um, I've got a little director's book, which is a, a little notebook, which is, I put all my notes in to give the actors and any sort of things that come to mind when the play is sort of um, being performed. And I, I was stood uh, in the aisleway there, in the, in the, in the, on the gangplank, if you like, which is um, where, the, where the seats are. And uh, my son had been sat next to me and I was watching the actors perform. And then suddenly I had the book in my left hand, which was next to the, the, um, uh, the seats. And I felt something pull the book. And then the book sort of opened in my hand, so it fell open. And I looked up uh, because I was sort of engrossed with what the actors were doing. And then I turned around to sort of tell Ellis to stop doing that, but there was nobody there. Um, and the pull on the book was quite forceful. It wasn't just like the book had opened. The book was actually pulled in my hand, hmm. and um, which was really unusual and really sort of, um, yeah, it, it made me sit back and think, well, that's really strange. Yeah. And during my life, I know that's, you know, to the listeners, that doesn't sound very interesting. And it's not what I would call a story and it's not what I would perform. But thinking back on it, it was very unusual. And there's a couple of times in my, in my life, you know, in the room where I'm sat now many years ago, I, I can remember being in, um, in the bathroom, which is in the middle of the day, which is right next to where I am now. And um, I walked out to the bathroom and out the corner of my eye, I saw a figure move from the main bedroom into the, um, into the room I'm sat in now. And um, I just turned and thought, well, what, what was that? And I think the amazing thing about sort of, if you can call them paranormal encounters, I don't know, is that I never went out looking for that. I didn't search for it. I certainly didn't expect it. Um, and it didn't frighten me in any way. Or it made me sit back and think, well, that was weird. But it was not until I sort of reflected on it that I thought, well, that's, that's really odd. But if you actually sat here now and said to me, well, do you believe in ghosts? I'll say, well, I don't know, really. I, I really don't know. Um, but I have had a few things which quite unexpectedly, and as I said, totally unlooked for. And I probably, there are loads of listeners out there who could say similar things that just happened just off the cuff that sort of flummoxed me, really, and, um, and have made me think, well, yeah, I, I can't really explain that. That was quite strange. And, and, and I, th I think you've been slightly unfair when you say, you know, that might not sound that interesting. I think they're very mm. interesting because they're real. So you're not talking about yeah. dragons fighting in the Mabinogion. You're talking literally a book being pulled out of your hand or yeah. whatever it was and some yeah. figure walking around, around your house. Now, <laughs> there are people who would find that. Yeah, that's scary. Or maybe when I put happened. it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so do you have any sort of opinions? And th I mean, you say you don't know if you believe in ghosts or not. If you were put on the no. spot and said, well, what, what is it then? What, what would you say? I don't know, Mark. I really don't know. Um, I just, I often sometimes maybe even talk myself out of it. You know, I can remember with the, the, when I say a figure, it was literally when you see something out the corner of your eye for a second, you know, and, uh, uh, and you saw almost your brain doesn't even register it. Well, it registers it, but you don't see it clearly. It was just a movement rather than a figure, but that's sort of, you know, a small, almost childlike height, which makes it even more spooky. Yeah. Uh, but my house is a new house, new build. No, well, it was, you know, uh, I've been the only people who've, who've lived here. And so there is that. And the pulling of the book, I, I, I just don't know what, what it, like I say, I'd like to think it's a ghost. I would like to think it's a ghost because I would like to believe in ghosts because I like mysteries and I like, um, I like unexplained things. And as a person, I really like, but I don't know. I don't know, was it a ghost or not, was it? When I say it could have been my imagination, but I think that's odd because sometimes if you're in a dark room and you're, you're sat alone and you hear noises, then your imagination is peaked. But when I'm concentrating on something totally different that's going on ahead, which is the actors performing on the stage, and then that happens for, and happens to be uncalled for, totally out of the blue, it, it, it leaves it hard to explain, Mark. But as I said, I, I, I don't know. I would like to believe in ghosts, but I don't know is my honest, 
inconclusive and on the <laughs> fence answer. Oh, I, I can't say anything because I am exactly the same. I do the, the politician's yeah. answer where you, you don't say yes, you don't say no. You, you, no. Just, you, yeah. you, you just hold your hands up and say, look, I, 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 God knows, I don't know. You know and may, maybe one day we will. Maybe if we keep doing podcasts like this, we, we'll find out yeah. some answers. I don't know. Well, well sorry, I'll, I'll throw it back. I know I'm the guest, not a host, you man. But <laughs> yeah. you're, you're someone who writes about ghosts. You're someone who researches ghosts. You're someone who, who spends a lot of time to look into archives and reading yeah. old stories. What about yourself? Have you got anything that's really made you sit up and think, whoa, you know, or has anything happened to you? Because you've been in situations, like, like I said, I've never gone looking for it. I don't mm. go with paranormal groups. I don't go to haunted locations expecting to see something. Yeah. But have you has anything happened to you that you, you want to share that's that, that's a very crafty way of turning the tables on me but uh, yeah but my, my I, I, look, I i've spent a lot of time in i've spent too much time probably in supposedly haunted places um part of it i can justify as my job i've been there as a journalist or i've been or, you know as an author writing about these places but i've also wasted a lot of my my own spare time as well because i enjoy it and more often than not it's quite nothing eventful happens but it's always fun. I, I think even, even if nothing weird happens, it's fun just being there with a group of friends running around in the dark on the rare occasions where things do happen. That adds to it, but I, I have never seen anything I would say, yes, that is definitely paranormal, but I have seen some, some weird old things over the years. Yeah, very good. Very any, any more yeah. questions, uh, interviewer? <laughs> or should, we, should, we, should we switch back? I'll, I'll sit back. I'll sit back. But, yeah. but no, uh, thanks. Yeah, but you, you know what I'm saying? I, I think mm. I'm, I'm, there's been a couple of occasions where I've, I've spoken to people who um, you know, are more into this sort of, um, like yourself, uh, paranormal groups, etc. And I think I have a theory. My theory is the more you look for these things, the less likely perhaps you are to see them. And, yeah. And just when things happen... As I said, in, in really, when I say mundane locations, but just where you don't expect it and you don't think it's happening and you're not looking for it, that's when these stories tend to happen, don't they? And, and probably when you look back through the stories that you, you put in your books, um, a lot of them are, um, are tend to be when someone's just walking down the street or someone is speaking to somebody or these things happen. They're not actually looking for these things to happen. They just do. And that is the interesting part, I think. And that, that's maybe the key. And they say, I, I do, believe it or not, I do a bit of running. And... Um, People say that the key to running is not thinking about running. Mm. So I think the key to ghost hunting is not thinking about ghosts, yes. you know? Um, just letting them happen to you, perhaps. I don't know. I'm no expert. I don't even know if I believe in them. But <laughs> yeah. there we are. That's been, my, uh, uh, that's been my sort of experience, if you like. Yeah. The, the, the first rule of ghost hunting is don't talk about ghost hunting or don't ghost mention hunting. ghost hunting, whatever, right. whatever what yes. it is. I remember, um, I mean, you saying that, Cymru, Cymru Paranormal, good friends of ours, the uh, yeah. ghost hunting group in, in Wales, and they always say that if you're going to go and investigate ghosts, you need to recreate the conditions that ghosts have been seen in the past by other people. And mm -hmm. if somebody sees a ghost at half past two in the afternoon in the kitchen on a summer's day, you should be there at half past two on a, you know, on, on, you recreate exactly the same. You shouldn't be walking around at three o'clock in the night with a torch and a shaky video camera <laughs> because <laughs> that's not when people have seen these things, you know, and, and it's pretty much yeah. what you were saying there, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah. they just pop up. Yeah, I, I think as well, you know, in those situations and in those, uh, when you create an atmosphere like that, and like yourself, uh, you've enjoyed uh, many times when you've gone to a haunted castle or a haunted house, and then um, you've gone around there and sort of um, been looking, actively out there looking for ghosts. And that's great fun. And you're with like-minded people, and it's a really enjoyable experience. Yeah. But you, the chances of you actually having that full-on ghost encounter are probably really rather slim. But then people see come back, come back with really compelling ghost stories that happen when they least expect them, and that is um, that's what I find interesting. Really, yeah. really interesting. <laughs> now I know we've we've spoken about the the real ghost stories or you know the the sort of real happenings, but I know you've yeah. also got a bit of folklore to share with us. Is is it fair to call it folklore? It's a ghost story, isn't it? But a folklore folkloric ghost oh, it, story. It's a Folkloric as it gets, really. Yeah. Um, basically, a short story that's very famous in Wales, but one that we could, um, uh, you could listen to, and maybe we could. Uh, I could just give a taste of what, uh, what as a storyteller, I do when I perform. Yeah. Really. So, do, do you want to sort of give a bit of background about the about the story that you're going to tell? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, what I, I'll do is I will just sell and um, I will tell the listeners. Basically, hmm. there's nothing mystical here, Mark, but I find that um, 
in this day and age, it's very difficult to get people's attention when uh, they're looking at their phones. There's so many things happening in life. We're all leading in such busy lives. So I started um, when I perform a story to try and create an atmosphere, and I'll do that right now. Mm-hmm. And um, that is to tell people about how um, storytelling used to be and what we should look at. And maybe uh, it sort of ties in with ghost stories, really, is that stories were traditionally told at a time called the time between times. Which is the time, it is neither night nor day, but the sun has gone and the sky is grey. The time between times is this time that people see lights in the sky. It's a time that people see ghosts. And it's a time that people see fairies. So let's leave our modern world and let's just sit back, listen. And no matter where you are, You could be sat in your car, in your living room, on your way to work, listening to this on your headphones. Just imagine that it's the time between times, that we are sat at the fireplace. The sky is grey. And although we can hear the howl of wolves, we can hear the growl of bears, we know that we are safe at the time between times. Now, for this story, I'm going to take you to a place in North Wales, Far from here, but actually quite close in the grand scheme of things. A place called Nant Gurthain, on the coast in North Wales. A windswept village, which is now a Welsh language research centre. But many, many years ago, it holds a grim and fascinating story. During the reign of the great King Henry VIII, where Thomas Cromwell dissolved the monasteries, the old church and abbey there, was torn down. And as the monks were being pulled away and taken away from the place they had lived for many years, one of them turned to the village folk who had not helped them when Henry's soldiers came a-calling and had put a curse upon the village that no children would ever be born there. And for many years this curse held true. But not long after, a young couple called Rhys and Minir who both lived in the village from when they were children, met and fell in love in the beautiful surroundings of Nant Gurthain. Now, high above the village, atop the cliff face overlooking the sea, is an old oak that's as old as the mountains and as capricious as the sea. It looks like a hooked hand, a clawed hand, overlooking the rocks. And Rhys and Minir would meet there and sit hand in hand, overlooking the village. For many years they courted, and finally they got permission to marry from both their families. And all of the village in Nankurthain was looking forward to the great wedding that would happen. Sat by the old hollow oak, Rhys arranged to meet Minir on the day before their wedding. He had for her a surprise. As he could see her crossing a winding path that led up to the old oak, he brought out his knife and carved on the oak. The initials in a heart of both him and his lover. Minir made her way there, and he unveiled it by moving away the heart with Rhys Loves Minir, written on the tree. Her reaction was quite unexpected. He thought that she would be happy. He thought that her heart would be filled with joy, but no. She started to cry and said to Rhys, You know about the curse. What you have done here is angered them, angered those who have cursed us. How can you say that we are lovers before we are married? You should not have put that heart on the tree. Rhys was quite taken aback, but tried to stop her, and in the end, they just embraced as she cried. And then, in their hearts, they looked forward to the next day. It was a great tradition in those times in Wales that when people were to be married, just before the ceremony, the bride in her bridal gown would run away and hide. And then the groom and the groomsman would spend the time trying to find her and bring her back to the church so the wedding could take place. And everyone would enjoy this festivity. And that this was nothing different. On the steps of the old church there they met. And Mainir looked at Rhys, winked at him, and ran off to hide. The groomsman counted to a hundred. It was a bright sunny day and everyone was happy. The village was decked out with garlands of flowers and the tide could be heard washing on the shore far away. Finally, 
they reached the count. And Rhys and his men started to look for Mynir. They looked down by the beach. They looked in her house. They looked in the small hall. They looked near the blacksmith's shop, but could not find her. Rhys started to grow worried and carried on looking for her. His groomsmen carried on, riding further out into the farms, into the countryside, into the trees following. But as the time between times came, the time when it was neither night nor day, but the sun had gone and the sky was grey, Mynir could not be found. Rhys grew very worried, as did Mynir's family, and they spent all night shouting, Mynir, Mynir, from the cliff tops, looking for her everywhere. But she could not be found. Days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months, and the months turned to years. And everyone involved had drifted away. Nobody knew where Mynir went, but all believed that maybe she'd had a change of heart. Maybe she had run away with another lover. But Rhys did not lose hope. And he wandered the clifftops, wandered the forests, wandered the beaches, calling out Mynir's name until the shoes rotted from his feet and his clothes tore, his beard grew long. But still he searched and searched. Till one day, as the sky grew grey, he made his way to the old oak and sat down and ran his fingers over the old moss-covered carving. Rhys loves my name, which was carved upon the tree. He started to weep, and as the night grew long, a storm came in from the sea. First it started to rain, until the rain was so heavy that it beat like thunder. And then the thunder started, so loud it felt like the gods were banging drums in the sky. Then the lightning started, light in the sky so bright that it was almost like day. And Rhys still sat there by the tree. Finally, at midnight, directly as the clock struck twelve, a lightning bolt shot from the sky and hit the old oak tree and crushed it asunder. It lit into fire and split apart. And there, in the hollow of the old tree, Rhys turned around. By the firelight, saw the skeleton of Mynir, dressed in a wedding dress, trapped in the centre of the old oak. She must have ran in there on the day of the wedding to hide, thinking Rhys would go there first. But he had not. And as she clambered within, she must have called and called Yet nobody found her, till eventually she died, and the curse carried on. And it is said now that in Nankurthain, at the time between times, where the stump of the old oak is still there, if you look up at the oak from the village, many people have seen the ghost of Rhys as he wanders the cliff face, looking for his wife who never was, Mynir both of them victims of the curse of Nant Gurthain. And that, my friends, is the end of that story. Thank you very much, Mark. I feel like I should, well, I will, I will clap. Let's have a round of applause <laughs> down the microphone. <laughs> and if that, if that doesn't send a, a chill down your spine, nothing will. And what, I mean, th this does, very neatly lead up to my next question, but one mm -hmm. of the amazing things with that is that even though this is a podcast, I'm, I'm watching you right now. I can see you on video. Um, sadly, nobody listening to this can, but it, it is, you, you're so animated doing it that <laughs> as it happens, you do have a video channel out there, which I was going to ask you about. So in theory, people they can they can take my word for it that it is well worth watching you as well as listening to you. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about that that YouTube channel? Yeah, oh, that's great. Thank you, Mark. Um, one of the things that's happened in lockdown, obviously, we haven't been able to go out as much, and performances have uh, been next to nothing. So I, I was just sitting here a little while ago, and I thought, wouldn't it be good to actually try and commit some of these stories to video? So um, I actually did just start a little channel. Um, if you um, Google or you, you type into YouTube. Owen Staten or Time Between Times, you will find a number of my stories. And literally all it is is basically what you can see now, which is me sitting, sitting in a chair uh, actually telling the stories. 
Um, I do a different one every week. I try to upload them on a Sunday. And um, I would love for any of your listeners, if they want to uh, hitch on and join me on, on that channel, I'm more than uh, happy to take requests. I'm more than happy to uh, look for other tales, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So I'd love to see some of the Ghosts of Wales listeners uh, pop over and visit me there. And also, um, I do quite a lot on Twitter, um, which is um, a medium that I use a lot, not just for storytelling. Uh, I'd like to tweet about just about anything. Um, that I come across in my life. And um, if they find look for me on Twitter, I'd be love to have them uh, on board as followers. And uh, I'd like to interact with anyone who would, has got any questions there as well. That would be great. Well, what, what I'll do, Owen, because when I upload this, I'll include a direct link as well to your videos on my website. So if anyone listening does need help, I mean, it's, it's quite easy to find you, isn't it, on, on search engines. Yeah. But if you need help, I'll put the link up as well. And, and I mean, you mentioned there, if people listen to my podcast, I think if they like listening to me talk about ghosts and folklore, then they're going to love you because you do, you do it <laughs> professionally rather than me waffling on, don't you? So that, that's a great thing as well. So I'm sure they'll well, be well, talking no, to see you. It's just a different thing, Mark, is it? I mean, as I said before, um, I think... Um, the, the key to ghost stories is finding these, these tales have got a bit of substance and uh, a lot of my tales aren't ghost stories they are stories about the Teletag, the Mary Lloyd um, stories about Welsh folklore Gellert, the two dragons, Vortigan's Kingdom all these um, old Welsh stories a lot of them are, are those type of things as well yeah. So, uh, anyone who's got interest in folklore in particular, um, uh, I'd love to see there. And anyone who's, like, as I say, have got any ideas of stories that I, I haven't heard or um, they'd like to hear told that would be fantastic well, and that see, you, you keep setting me up without without knowing what you're doing at the moment. <laughs> However, that sets me up nicely to, to my next bit. Um, but you, you mentioned the Mary Lloyd, and w yep. w when I launched this podcast, I actually thought that, look, the Mary Lloyd is such a huge, huge thing in Welsh folklore. It should be the first one, but at the same time, it's a Christmas time tradition and doesn't pop up until, <laughs> until the new year. So I've been sitting yeah. here every week going, Mary Lloyd, no, wait, 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 wait. So maybe <laughs> at Christmas time, we should get together and do some kind of Mary Lloyd special, um, which leads very nicely into the uh, little surprise announcement we have, which is mm -hmm. we are hoping to actually team up and do a proper podcast together going forward, aren't we, if, uh, if it all works out? That would be, yeah, that would be fantastic again. It'd be nice to go out on location, wouldn't it? And yeah. maybe um, tell stories and, and look at things where, uh, where, where ghosts have been seen exactly and, and do a bit of research and find out more about the area and, um, and the stories of the area as well. And I'm sure some of the listeners would be interested. Uh, well, I hope so anyway. And yeah, it's something I'm looking forward to very much. Well, people can hold it to us, hold us to it now, because in, in the past, well, it was yeah. just me and you talk, talking rubbish. But now it's out there <laughs> in the world. People are going to come yeah. up to us in the street and go, "Hey, where's this? Uh, where's this podcast you promised us?" So we have to make it happen yeah. now. So, yeah, that's why you've committed it to the internet. Now it's there forever, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So, uh, look into the future, then, Owen. Uh, anything else you want to to mention? Anything exciting going on? Well, at the moment, as I say, I'm just waiting for the time we can start performing again. I mean, if um, people are listening to this now in uh, August 2020, but, um, you know, things are, things are quite tight at the moment and quite, and quite hard. So um, I, I'm just hoping everyone's okay. I'm hoping that um, these sort of things, uh, you know, bring a little bit of joy into people's lives anyway and uh, people with an interest in this type of thing. But I would certainly like to, um, uh, as I say, get out there more and visit some, uh, some other locations and, uh, and document some of the uh, lesser known tales so that we can bring to this audience. Uh, and I think that is something I'd really like to do in the future and something I can really look forward to. And of course, Mark, where, I, where you could really help me out is um, I've always wanted to write a book. I've always wanted a book. Yes. But I've got a few ideas and fictions in my, in, in my mind, but um, um, uh, you know, maybe you could help me out with some knowledge there. That would be great. Well, if you keep helping me out with podcasts, I'll, I'll help you out with the book <laughs> and then teamwork. And, and again, you've committed yourself to this as well. Now, this again is out in the world. So you, it, it has to happen. And <laughs> I also, you, hope, I mean, you mentioned there this is going out in August 2020. Wouldn't it be mm -hmm. nice if somebody out there in August 2021 is playing catch up and listening back to last year's podcasts and is wondering what all the fuss was about? Things, things have some kind of normality again. Yeah, that would be brilliant, isn't it? Or if people were looking back at this in um, 2051 and looking yes. at it and listening to it, wow, what are they talking about? Because <laughs> yeah. um, it, 
I never thought I'd, I'd live to see days like this. And yeah, you must be the same. I never in a million years thought that uh, we'd be living the lives we live in at the moment, you know, months after um, everything has gone on. And um, it certainly has been an interesting time, hasn't it? Yes. 2051, they'll be living underwater and things. And li- Actually, that's, that's a busted oh. song, isn't it? <laughs> and, I, I, I never, <laughs> of all the people, I yeah. never thought I'd be quoted <laughs> on this podcast. Yeah. Or it's McFly, it's, it's one, of the, one of those bands. <laughs> or McBusted. Well, McBusted, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a McBusted song. <laughs> Which is probably a good a good time to wrap things up, really, isn't it? If we're it is. if we're veering off into into nineties pop or two thousand whenever it was um, pop. So uh, thank you very much, Owen. Uh, it's been amazing to have you on the podcast, and you're going to have to come back very soon. Uh, I'd be a, I'd be uh, I'd be an absolute pleasure, Mark. It's been great to uh, to chat to you again. I haven't seen you for a little while, and um, uh, how, how much I've really enjoyed the episodes you've put out as well. And um, I'd love to come back on. Uh, anytime, just give me a shout. I'll be there. You keep the compliments coming and we'll, we'll keep you on the show. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. And now we return to normality. <coughs> oh, that, that really does, does hurt. Um, yes, now we are back to normal. Owen has gone. It's just me sitting here on my own talking to you down a microphone and how amazing was Owen I mean I've I've known Owen some time now and I've I've heard many of these stories and they still amaze me whenever I get the opportunity to listen to them again as he mentioned he is recording them and uploading them onto YouTube so if you'd like to go and check them out uh, and why wouldn't you then you can track Owen down on YouTube and you know it's all free it won't cost you a penny so go and have a listen and that leads me I guess to the usual point in the show where I like to ask what you think about what what, what has been quite a packed episode really we, we've spoken about storytelling are, are you a storyteller do you agree with Owen what do you think about the future of the art with especially at the moment where with the way the world is Are you finding things more difficult or weirdly, could things like social distancing actually make storytelling more appealing? Because it it is, for the most part, a solitary act. It's just you. You don't have to worry so much about interacting with other people. So could this possibly be a time to embrace storytelling when other art forms are much more difficult to put on. I, I, I don't know. I'm just throwing ideas out there. But as usual, get in touch. Let me know what you think. I'm on all the main social media channels. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Track me down. Search for Mark Reese. Put the word ghosts in or the word folklore and I'll pop up on top. And we can chat about storytelling we can also chat about Reese R. Minor and one of the things I particularly love about Owen's version is that I am quite familiar with that story and then when I listen to Owen tell it I pick up new little details each time maybe maybe that's the same for you maybe you've never heard it before and now you're too scared to go near a tree or to to get married I, I don't know but As always, please get in touch. And of course, there's the obligatory shout out that if you have enjoyed this episode, please consider hitting the subscribe button. It's great for you because you never miss an episode ever. And it's great for me because I know people appreciate this podcast and are listening and are tuning in and it's worth doing more. So anything you can do, subscribe, press the like button, leave a nice review, tell your friends, shout it from the rooftops. That would be very, very much appreciated. All of which leaves me to say that I've got a special surprise up my sleeve this week because I'll be uploading not one, but two episodes. I've got a special bonus episode going up this week. If you do subscribe, as mentioned there, you'll know exactly when. And this is a particularly good episode. It's one of my favourite haunted places on the planet. Uh, And it's being released for a special reason. You'll find out why when it pops up. So keep an eye out because there is going to be Two episodes this week, not just the one. Buy one, get one free. Even though you don't buy it, even even though it's free anyway. So buy none, get two free. 
Does that make sense? By none get to... I, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's reached that point now where, where we are right at the end of the episode and I am waffling nonsense again. So I am going to shut up. I am going to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian. I hope you've enjoyed this first attempt at getting a guest on. It was amazing of Owen to give up his time and join me. If you have any ideas for future guests, please, again, let me know via the usual channels. All of which just leaves me to say, finally, that I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming live from Wales to the world. It's the best. It's the beautiful. It's the only Ghosts and Folklore from Wales podcast and a special prize to the first person who can tell me what film I nicked that quote from and well actually what what I should say is it's the best it's the beautiful it's the only Ghosts and Folklore from Wales podcast and it's the only podcast I imagine that ends with such Terrible, heavy breathing. No star.